Well, John, thank you so much for joining me again on this episode of Lynch with a Leader. It is a honor to have you, buddy. Hey, the honor's all mine. When Mike calls, you answer. <laughs> That's right. Mike's the best. You're making up for all the girls that didn't feel that way in high school. So I appreciate you uh, Listen, coming through for me. I, I had a rough to, dating the, experience The caller ID did me in, man. It did me <laughs> in. I have to be honest with you. I like oh. pre-caller ID much better. Yeah, I had you a know, rough You begin, too. you've got a brand new book out, The Non-Anxious Life. And it it is like reading the diary of where everybody lives right now. What was it about anxiety? You said, I've got to, I've got to do something to address where people are living. What would you say? Man, if, if I'm a hundred percent candid and we're on Lynch with the leader, so I'm going to be a hundred percent honest in this answer. I could give you a, a good media answer. Here's the truth. Um, the last book I wrote did really well. And so I thought I had some cachet with the publishing team and we sat down to talk about what's next. And they said, um, we want you to revisit anxiety. I'd written a mm -hmm. tiny little book on it a few years ago and it had sold well. And I said, I want to write a book on friendship or I want to write a parenting book. And they said, you're going to write a book on anxiety and what your publishing team gets to do. And so I kicked and screamed and was annoyed by it and started the project. And about halfway through it, I had an interaction. We can talk about this later, but I had a confrontation, if you will, with my wife in my garage. And I went away from my house. I left my wife and kids for a little over a week. And I went and moved into a hotel where I was just going to write and try to get this manuscript done. And I ended up realizing I'm not living this. I am creating a wildly anxious life. And so here I am lecturing America on how to live a non-anxious life. And so at that moment, the book took a very turn from me being a grad school professor, again, lecturing my students to me pulling up a, a seat and saying, Hey man, I'm uh, let's figure this out. Cause I'm with you. And mm -hmm. so it became a very personal book. And the truth is, man, we were just talking off air. I'm living in kind of a glitch in the matrix right now. I've got a pretty cool gig and I've got a really supportive team and um, books are selling well and the show's doing good. And my wife loves me and my kids are healthy. If I'm anxious mm. with every privilege under the sun, if I'm anxious, there's something in the water, there's something in the air. And so um, this really became a passion project of mine. What has gone wrong? What has gone sideways? And um, the book is just a roadmap out. And right out of the shoot, you make a statement. You said, all of us have anxiety. And it may be to varying degrees. Why do you feel confident with that statement? This is something we all deal with. Yeah, I, I, I used to um, be, when I was an academic nerd, I used to you know push my nerd glasses up my nose and say like, well, anxiety is actually a clinical diagnosis. And so what you're feeling, it, and then uh, I was talking over people. I was talking around and past people. This is the word we use for burnout, for chronic stress, for that low, that just that hum in our lives that something could be different. Something could be better. My marriage could be better. What's wrong with my kids? And um, so either you're experiencing that mm -hmm. or you're married to somebody who is you're leading somebody who is. And so every one of us is dealing with this in some shape, form or fashion. Um and I personally don't believe that all of our bodies broke at the same time. I don't think there's something wrong with us. I think there's a much bigger issue going on. Do you think it's more prevalent now than it's ever been? Do you think do. it's a something way different than our parents dealt with? Why, why would you uh, think uh, that? Um, my wife is a qualitative researcher for years. She's an author now, but she spent years um, interviewing those who lived through the Great Depression, those who mm. lived through World War II. And there was a lot of heartache and starvation and fear. There wasn't an anxiety because there was a unified mission. There was a purpose. Everyone had a purpose. And that purpose might be to survive. That purpose might be to not die today or make get food for my kids. But there wasn't this pervasive overwhelm of the system. Um, there was this, well, we got to go fight Nazis. Let's go do it. And, well, they're all fighting Nazis. I guess we're not going to be able to stay at home. We got to go make bombs in the factory. I mean, there was a very, yep. all of us are into it. And so going back and looking at these old letters, there's fear, there's heartache. There's not anxiety. There's not depression in these moments. It's when you get home and you land back in the loneliest generation in human history that we've created for ourselves. When you have this ecosystem in the media that's telling you 24-7, 365, that it's all coming down. You're doomed. They're doomed. We're all doomed. 
and there's nothing you can do about it. There's just this pervasive world we've created. So yeah, I do think that when it comes to our bodies not responding to the environment as they were designed to, I think we're in un uncharted water. You know, it's so funny. I was on a call last uh, week with a couple, you know, it was a bunch of ADs, athletic directors across the country. And they said one of the biggest struggles they have right now is hiring young coaches because the young coaches want to avoid, avoid burnout. So they don't want to take coaching roles at the schools. They're happy with just the daytime part. They don't want to do the after hours part because they don't want to create it more, any more anxiety and burnout. And so they were saying, and this is a question they asked me, they said, do you think that burnout, did they even understand what burnout means? What do you, what do you think about that? Burnout is not, I'm working a lot. And burnout is not, I'm super, super exhausted. You can be super, super exhausted. I remember um, like track meets when I was a track runner and uh, football games when I was a Texas high school football. I remember jujitsu matches where I'm so exhausted. I need a group of a, a couple of other men to pick me up off the, off the ground, a couple of teammates to pick me up. I'm so spent. Um, that's not burnout. Burnout is when your body says, I quit. Yeah. You are not taking care of this machine and I quit. It's, um, man, you can't be a coach. I've been a high school coach at the super five, a level in Texas. I know what that, what running around is at that level. You can't do that and not sleep, not take mm -hmm. care of your body, mm -hmm. not have deep, meaningful relationships that you can anchor into, not have some sort of faith ecosystem somewhere, some belief in something bigger than yourself. You can't. Yeah. Um, if you're chasing wins, you're going to cut corners. And the moment you lose, you're going to look in the mirror and think I'm nothing. Right. And so you've got a generation of people that's not tied to a bigger purpose. Used to when I was coaching, it was very clear. We are raising young men. Yep. We are creating the future leaders of our local community. And now it is not the purpose of being a coach is you will get that win or we're all fired. And because yep. uh, our athletic director has using um and the board of this particular high school district is using football to do revenue shortfalls from the state. And so, I mean, it's, it's not a game anymore. It's not a raising young men, this unified cultural purpose. This is, you will get a W or, or you're done. That's a recipe for burnout, man. You know, it's, you made a statement really early in the book. I thought was so good. You said we've created a world where our bodies cannot exist. Right. You know, we, why have we, how have we let ourselves get there? How in the world, knowing what we know, as smart as our society is, how have we done that? I th I'm going to give you a very unpolitical answer. I don't think that 99.999% of us who've created this culture over the last 50 to 100 years did so maliciously. I just mm. don't. Mm. And I look at Washington and I, you know, it's fun to be a conspiracy theorist and be like, they're planning for this. Dude, they can't plan what they're having for breakfast. They can't plan their way out of a wet paper bag. I don't ah, think anybody, so I think the scariest thing about the last few years, I mean, the last 10 years of politics is, is I think all of us thought like there's this, there's this group of 10 people that get in a room and figure it out. I think after the last decade, we've realized, oh crap, there's no driver. There's nobody driving. <laughs> Like we're just like, you know, like we're, we're off into the woods, man. I, here's what I think happened. I think two things happen simultaneously. Number one, um, we discovered the scientific method and we began as a culture on the back end of the enlightenment to worship progress, technology, mm -hmm. scientific advancement, which is quite honestly, an amazing thing. And what that allowed us to do overnight was to, be more comfortable to put it simply your grandmother doesn't have to die from heat stroke we created this thing called an air conditioner it's amazing and you don't have to have back issues driving across the country in a covered wagon made of wood we've got leather seats and shocks on a truck and and so in this pursuit of comfort you don't have to be uncomfortable for three days with a virus while it just cycles through your body and by the way makes your body stronger as it's as your body learns to fight it just take these medicines and you don't, you can just sleep and you can just avoid the discomfort. And so in, in without meaning to, we all started trying to solve for comfort. And at the same time, we begin to pathologize discomfort. Anything uncomfortable over the last hundred years was something was a problem to be solved too hot, 
Gotcha. Too cold. Gotcha. And what has happened over time is we used to go to the weight room knowing we're going to be uncomfortable for a while because the growth on the back end of this discomfort is going to make us more comfortable for longer. Mm. Now we skip the weight room. Don't go in there. Let's just take all the weight off the bar. It's too heavy. And so we've created a world void of discomfort. Discomfort is our enemy. And the terrible part is we've solved for all the other issues. You can pull out your cell phone and punch one button and food will show up at your office right where you're sitting. You can go turn a knob and water just comes out, right? We've solved all those issues. And so like our bodies are designed to do, it just moved to the next issue. And now the next issue is the words you say make me uncomfortable. The thoughts you have make me uncomfortable. The way you want to solve this problem is uncomfortable to me. And so now I got to end you. Now I've got to get you out of the ecosystem so that I'm not uncomfortable. Though, So we throw words around like safe. I don't feel safe or I don't feel validated. It all comes down to we have pathologized discomfort. And anybody who works with young people or anybody who works in any sort of psychology, ministry, knows the only path to resilience and strength and confidence and growth is through discomfort. That's the mm -hmm. only way. And so I think overnight we created this thing. And the second thing we did at the same time is we begin to worship technology. The language of, um, hey, those aren't demons. It's just a serotonin imbalance. Um, we cut the strings on these narratives, these binding stories that for generations, for all of human history, people walked outside of their tent and they looked up to the sky and they said, dear God or gods, please rain or my family dies. Well, now I just turn a nozzle, man. And so I think at the same time we begin to worship technology and advancement and science, we got real arrogant and we placed ourselves at the center of the universe. And I think we're finding out in real time, oh, gosh, we skipped the weight room and we've been strutting around thinking we're tough. And now real crisis is on us and we don't have the skills or the confidence to do so. And we've made ourselves the center of the universe and the self can't hold that up. That's right. And um now we're all running around playing whack-a-mole with alcohol and pornography and achievement and hours worked and dollars earned as band-aids for this existential chaos that we've created for ourselves. And our bodies are ringing off the hook with anxiety trying to get our attention. And and in this book, you're not saying you're not, not going to deal with anxiety. You're going to work anxiety. And you say it in the book – Anxiety is not a bad thing, correct? It's not the problem. Yeah. That's right. It's, it's not the issue. The, the the policeman slowing you down is not the bad guy. He's doing his job. He's trying to keep you from getting in a car wreck and hurting a bunch of people. Similarly, or your smoke detector in your house. That's the yeah. analogy I use That's in the book. That's a great illustration. It's That's not really the problem. Good. It's annoying. You wish you, yep. you could just stay on the couch while it rang. The issue is your house is on fire. That's what you need to mm. deal with. Anxiety is just a smoke alarm. And even knowing all that you know. So here you are in the middle of writing this book and getting all your thoughts together, lecturing, doing a call-in show, and you still succumb to it. You yeah. still get sucked in by it. Well, so here's what I got sucked into. Um, one of the things to talk about in the book is if your body scans the environment and recognizes that you're lonely, that you're the only one on, mm -hmm. the, on, the, on, the, on the planes, your tribe has left you, it's going to make you anxious. It's going to ring the alarms to get your attention. And suddenly I hit, had a hit show on my hands and suddenly I had a best-selling book and suddenly I'm getting asked to speak all over the country at schools and colleges and businesses. And suddenly I quit going to the Monday night gatherings with my buddies. I quit showing up for the night when they all got together to watch the fights. I skipped the concerts and then I started skipping our calls and then our text threads that we have. I quit returning those right afterwards with my own funny meme. And so I woke up in a hotel room a number one best-selling author with nobody to call. And my body was getting my attention. You're not all right. And then I started skipping my workouts. I'll get it tomorrow. I'll get it tomorrow. And uh, I can have a donut, dude. I've been working out hard. And suddenly my health isn't great. And my marriage slowly starts getting some cracks in it because I'm not, I'm, me and my wife become really good co-managers because I'm coming in from off the road. I drop all my crap and then I leave the next day. And I don't know how to deal with my seven-year-old daughter. And so I start avoiding a little bit. And so all of that I could point to and go to a doctor and say, I needed my anxiety to go away. 
what the doctor, if they're wise, would say is, what is your anxiety trying to tell you? And it's mm -hmm. like, oh, man, mm -hmm. I need not even to slow down. I need to make sure I'm connected with your tribe. I need to make sure that my marriage is whole. I need to make sure that I'm leaning into, into learning the things I need to do to be a parent um, in the 21st century, which is hard. Um, and so, again, in my own life, anxiety is not the issue. The issue is I've let these important core areas of being a human go. And my body does what it, what it should do when it's working well, which is sounds the alarms. You made a statement in there, joy and pain are both on the same switch. Yeah. Why are joy and pain unable to be extricated from each other? Because um, they are they are one and the same. They are teammates, the same they're they're opposite sides of the same coin. And um I only really am able to sit and bask in the love of my wife because I know the pain of being alone. And I know the pain of her and I being um, on different pages and sitting across the table and saying, are we actually going to keep doing this? Mm. I only know the joy of winning when I know the pain of loss, right? right. They just work together. And there, the, there's a neurochemistry component to that. Um, that the same parts of your body that sends in the we're all okay also sends out the we're not okay. And you shut the whole machine off. That's cool, man. But you shut the whole machine off when you do. Yeah. You know, people listening to this call are spiritual leaders. I mean, they're, they're people that are in boardrooms and locker rooms. They're trying to lead. They're trying to do their deal. And I think for all of us, and I've been pastoring golly for a long time now, we want to think if I pray right, if I do right, if I live right, if I give right, if I, we would tell our people this isn't true, but we, we want to believe it's true for us. Mm -hmm. I don't have to deal with any of this. Going even back into scripture, how has God used anxious moments to develop people's faith in a way they couldn't have been developed another way? Oh, man, um, that's a really great question. I think um, you can read through Scripture and see with David, with Jesus on his face in the garden saying, do we have to do it like this? Right. Right. I know what I'm about to go through. Um, you see it all through Scripture, through every, every, you know, every major leader, every minor character is struggling with something that we would diagnose today right and i think as a part of the uh, we're, i was talking about earlier about the desire to not feel uncomfortable mm. we have pathologized sadness we've pathologized heartbreak we've pathologized grief oh you're you're sad take this just take this and you won't feel that so bad, so much. Um, and so I think all through scripture, God uses that in my own life where I've seen it powerfully is, um, man, I get pretty frustrated to be honest with you. When I hear pastors who are my friends, pastors in, just out in the wild say, just turn it all over to God. There's a congregation going, I don't know what that means. Mm, mm, I'm trying, mm. I'm praying, I'm journaling, I'm reading this book, but my wife doesn't like me and I don't know what to do. My, my, um, my dream for the American church is to start a human one oh one series to stop with all the, similarly, as I'm really pressing back hard against the academic community that not the Hubermans and the Atias of the word, world, because they're talking to other academicians. They're talking to other really brilliant minds solving hard problems. I'm talking to the group of influencers who are using all this huge psychology language trying to talk down to people. It's not helping. It's not helping. Similarly, I'm tired of all the theological deep kumbaya speak. Like, dude, how do I be a better dad? That's Will right. you help me with that? Can you help me be a coach? Cause I'm drowning here and you keep telling me just to turn all over to God. And if I'm anxious, it's because I haven't turned over secrets. No, I've turned it all over. I don't know what to do. And so I think God is using our innate body alarm systems, just as he designed us to, as a wake up call to the church, we're losing people because we're talking over them. We're talking at them. We're not talking with them. We're not talking for them. And so, um, sorry for that little soapbox, man, but I think there's a moment in time when, you can't just keep blaming the people who are hurting for their pain. You got to sit down and say, where's it hurt, man? Let's start there. Yeah. 
I don't know how to talk to my teenager. And I don't think teenagers are supposed to hate their parents, even though that's what they tell me in my in, in the popular press. Actually, the neuroscience would back you up. They're not supposed to. That's a recent phenomenon. I think it's starting there. Um, and so I think God is using this collective anxiety as a wake up call. Like this, this is not sustainable, y'all. And um, similarly, when I talk to, to especially to married couples, you don't have to wait until your marriage is in ash to fix it, mm, to heal, mm. to build something different. You don't. And I want to scream my head off. And I know that wouldn't it'd be me acting like a child. It wouldn't help anything at our Washington leaders. Guys, we don't have to wait until this whole thing burns to the ground to try to build something else. Y'all can be grownups and stop throwing erasers and crayons at each other and sit down and solve some of these big challenges. And it's going to hurt all of us. It's going to be painful. And that's the only way forward. And so I, I um, and church is, is a very similar thing. I, church leaders across the country are just throwing their hands up. Everybody's just leaving. It's because they're weak. It's, no, it's because CrossFit is, is their new church because CrossFit says, come in and we're going to teach you how to live a little bit better life. The book club is saying, hey, we'll listen to you. Come on in and we'll give you a better life. I tell leaders all church leaders all the time, church isn't going away. It's just showing up in gyms and jujitsu classes and other places where they're actually meeting the needs of the people. They're not talking down to them. So, uh, I mean, I think God's working hard. Um, I think he is He is moving loudly um, if we'll only hear him. Yeah, and people are looking for something, right? You say it in there. The opposite, the opposite of anxiousness is peace. And you say it's possible to choose peace. Yeah. How have you done that? What has changed most about you as a le leader where you're going, I'm going to live in an anxious world, but I'm going to choose peace in it? How's that changed you? Um, I think it's a series of very, very practical steps. My wife and I started 15 years ago, actually 18 years ago, working. We both come from literally nothing. My dad was a cop and then became a minister. And there were seasons we didn't have money for groceries. Um, and my mom and dad shared one car and my wife's parents were elementary school teachers. Um, we both decided early on, we both are in the education world for forever. And we were at helpers. We're not going to make any money. So we're going to work really hard. And we spent 15 years. And now, Mike, I don't know anybody anything. Mm -hmm. So if I get fired tomorrow, that sucks. And I'm going to go find the next thing. But I don't owe anybody anything. Yep. And so I might be mad if I get fired. I might be really frustrated. But I'm not going to be anxious because mm -hmm. I got an emergency fund I've been saving up for a decade right? Because I drove a $3,000 truck when I was a dean of students at a law school because I don't care what you think about my car. I care that my family can breathe, right? Mm. So there's some steps like I'm not going to owe anybody any money. Every September, um, in fact, it goes out tomorrow. My wife and I send an email out to all of our family and we tell them, here's when we are going to travel or if we're going to travel for the holiday season. There is all clarity, this year is going to be a crazy year because I'm on the road and it's all over the place. So we're going to go for one week and we're going to visit everybody for 48 hours. And if they want to get upset about that, they're grownups and they get to do that. Mm -hmm. But that's not my responsibility. What's my responsibility and my wife is to see what best honors our family, right? So there's some very practical things yep. there. And then on the existential side as a leader, I am working hard and I've been working hard for the last 10 years to stop losing sleep over things I simply cannot do anything about. And that's the hardest thing in the world. Um, I get one vote every two years and I get one big vote every four years. That's <laughs> what I get. And I can yell and scream and I can watch the political shows 24, seven, 365. Mike, I can do literally nothing except I can love my neighbor. Right. I can show up and love my neighbor. I can meet Kevin. And Kevin has a different um, flag in his front yard. He did. Kevin has a different sign in his front yard. And Kevin's my neighbor. And Jesus didn't say, love your neighbor, unless he votes differently than you. He said, love your neighbor. That's right. And especially love your enemies. Okay, cool. We're having a barbecue at my house. You're coming. And suddenly, all these things we see on the news, I mean, that's a way different conversation when they're sharing a meal with you at your table. Um, and so, man, I can't control so I can't control what's going to Russia right now. I hate it. It makes me sick to my stomach. The thought of my son getting drafted makes me 
I can't do anything about it. So right. what I'm going to do, I'm going to be a great neighbor. I'm going to tip really well when I take my son to Waffle House. And I'm going to do those things that I can't. I'm going to treat my wife right. And I'm going to be a good citizen of my small town that I live in. That's what I could do, man. I'm going to be a good member of my church. And um, I'm going to go that route. And those two things allow me to enter into the most chaotic situation. There's brains over here. There's bodies over here. There's police officers over here. There's screaming mothers over here. It allows me to enter into those spaces, not with out fear and not without um, being amped up, but I'm not anxious. Mm. I'm not mm. anxious. And, and that's a different, that's peace despite your circumstance. Which changes who you are in the circumstance, right? I mean, it Always. changes how you meet with your neighbor. And then all of a sudden you sit down with them and you go, wow, they're really not that mean. And they don't seem to hate me I, either. They agree to disagree with me. I agree to disagree with them, but we can be friends. And it's just a whole different world. But it's was, a choice was, you made. It's a choice. I was speaking at an event and Malcolm Gladwell was also on the bill. And he said something I'd never heard it put this way. It makes total sense. But he said, instead of sitting down with a guy next to you who believes differently than you on these four things, make a list of all the things you agree on. You want your kids to go to school and be safe? You want your marriages to be good? You want your neighborhoods to be safe? You want... He goes, your list of things y'all agree on will be 100x the things you disagree on. That's right. And, man, if you start there, you, you and your wife. Um, disagree on more than you and your neighbor do, right? She wants the dishes exactly like right. this, and she wants your garage like this, and she wants your waistline like this, and all those like you're gonna agree way more with your neighbor than you think you do. So start with the things that you're for, not the things you're against, man. Mm. You you make a statement. I want to dive into your. Um, you're getting me all worked up, Mike. Oh, dude, listen, man, we, we, <laughs> we're just, we're just scraping the surface. I'm usually a walking Paxil and you got me all fired up this morning. That's good. <laughs> well, you know, these daily choices you talk about, you, you make a statement. I really appreciate it. That anxiety is not an identity. And I think it's so easy in our culture. <clears throat> we were talking about the ages of our kids for your children and my children, even more than my generation. I'm in my fifties to use it as an identity it's yeah. something they're going to live with it doesn't have to be who they are and you give some choices that we get to make every day one of those and i love this is to choose reality yeah. why in building an, a, a non-anxious life do we have to stare down what reality really is why can we not avoid that so underneath um, underneath anxiety is this idea that if your body – the nerd word is agency or autonomy. Um, when your body recognizes that you are in the backseat of your own life, you're not driving. Somebody else is. It will sound the alarms. And you can say to yourself all day long, I need a Suburban. I need a car that's this big. I only got two kids, but we need this much space because once a month we have to move around some fi five kids. And it has to have screens because my kids have to be able to stare at a screen. And it has to have leather, and I want to get these black rims. You can, you can paint this picture, and then you can go to a dealer and get 72 months, no interest, 0% APR. And there's a part of your brain that will know that is an incredible mathematical deal you just scored. No interest for that many years? That's amazing. And that little almond-shaped part in the base of your brain, the, your amygdala, that's designed to scan your environment 24-7, 365, it knows what you make. And it knows that now you have just signed over agency. You have chained yourself to Chevrolet Motor Company Financing Division. They will tell you what you're doing for work tomorrow. They will tell you that I don't care how abusive that boss is. You're going in. I don't care how sick your kid is. You will go make that shift because you are now, as the Bible says, borrower slave to the lender. You are now under their control and you do it with their mortgage and you do it with your credit cards and you do it with, oh, I got good air mileage, mileage points. Your body is in touch with reality 24-7, 365. And when there's a gap, when you're in the back seat of your own life, your body will sound the alarms. And if we hear it all the time, we're in the attention economy. This is the attention economy. That's that's a that's like saying, like, 
um, <laughs> Lucky Charms is part of a healthy breakfast. <laughs> it is not. Um, that's a really nice way to say that. Um, the attention economy is a really nice way of saying we're in the distraction economy. If you're feeling uncomfortable, if you're feeling sad, if you're feeling lonely, if you feel like I don't know what I'm doing in my own house because I'm, my kids don't like me, my wife doesn't like me, uh, my husband's always on his phone, then we have an economy that says you should buy this. You should click here. Netflix says, hey, we're just going to start the next series for you. You don't have to pick up the remote. We've been scanning all of the websites you go to in your house and all the things you watch and for how long. And what scenes you pause. So we know you better than you do. So you're going to love this new series. Just sit there. We'll start it for you. And or we have another drink and another drink or the rise in pornography. All these things to distract us from reality. Mm. And so it would make no sense to start a weight loss journey without first stepping on a scale and saying, okay, what is the number? It makes no sense to start a supplement regimen to begin getting healthier without a, a baseline blood test. Nobody starts running a marathon without knowing where the starting line is. Choosing reality is a daily practice. How is my marriage? How's my wife? What's my relationship with my kids? Is it? Do I need to stop what I'm doing and write a quick note? Do I need to cut my workout one reps, one set short so that I can sit down and with my daughter and have oatmeal before I have to run out the door to work? Mm -hmm. What is the state of my job? Is it about to go away? Am I going to get fired? Like Your body's solving all the time for reality. And until you sit it back in the front seat, um, it's going to sound the alarms. And by the way, if you know you're getting fired and you're in the front seat, you're not going to be anxious. You might be pissed. You might be scared. You're not going to be anxious because you're driving. Your body yeah. doesn't need to sound that alarm system, right? It's a totally different problem. You're not going to be burned out. You're solving problems, right? You don't hear uh, Super Bowl coaches like, man, I'm really burned out. No, you want to win that game, yep. right? You're, you've got a common purpose with a group of men y'all are going to war together. Um, you don't hear burnout talk. You hear burnout with guys who are losing all the time who just want to get that W and now we're off to a different race. You know, what would you say to somebody who goes, I just don't like bad news. Like I don't, it makes me anxious to think things aren't good. Mm. What would you say to them? A beautiful, it's, it's pretty amazing how our brains are designed, but I don't want to get too dorky, but uh, when your body is anxious about something, Bad news. Give me give me one piece of bad news that you hear sometimes. Oh, uh, my kids aren't at school who I wish they were. Like, my kids are making bad choices. Okay, my kids, yeah. Yep. They, I, I found some text messages. I gave yep. my kid unfettered access to the World Wide Web, and they acted like a 12-year-old, and they <laughs> went down the rabbit holes. And I don't like who they are now. Yeah. Or their choices have freaked me. But I don't like to think about that because there's shame involved. I shouldn't have. I wish I hadn't of. Um, in the U.S., we use our children as our report card for how well we're doing, and they can't carry that weight, right? But mm. we, we can't handle it. So our brain sounds the alarm, and we avoid looking at our kid's cell phone that we know they shouldn't have. And interestingly, our brain wins. It got exactly what it wanted, which is to not have that shame bath that frustration bath that i don't know what to do bath it avoided it it won and what does it do it puts a little gps pin in avoid and so the next time you start to grab that phone it's going to make you anxious and it's going to make it louder hey 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 hey! it's gonna get it's gonna get more uh violent that alarm system to avoid it and that's why we anxiety gets more anxious and more anxious and more anxious so the person who says i feel better when i avoid i would say for now, similarly, good. the problem with alcohol is it works. Yep. The problem with um, have stepping out on your wife when your marriage is on life support, it's awesome to feel alive. It's awesome to have another person look at you for the first time in 10 years and say, oh, no, I desire you. It works until everything burns to the ground. Mm -hmm. And so you can avoid anxiety. You can avoid that smoke alarm in your kitchen and just duct tape a pillow over it. That's cool. You, and you can stop hearing the alarm. Your house is going to burn to the ground. The only way to get the alarms to turn off is to head directly into them and face it. And once your body knows you're in the driver's seat, it doesn't have to sound those alarms anymore. And then you got to deal with reality. Oh, my 12-year-old has been looking at pornography for the last year and a half when I gave him this phone. 
oh, my 12-year-old is sending pictures to a 16-year-old and I can't breathe. You got to deal with that because that's reality. That's truth. That's where we are right now, right? Or my kid is commenting on websites and there's other adults on that website slowly tightening the predatory noose around my kid. Yep. I got to deal with that, right? That's reality. And your brain's going to scream at you until you deal with it. You know, you even go back to Jim Collins' classic book, Good to Great. It was one of the things, confront brutal realities. It's one of the things companies have to do to go from good to great. And I think we have to do it as people. And then you wrote in there too, and I, we won't spend too much time on it, but you mentioned it earlier, is choosing connection. Choosing that I am going to not live an alone life. You work with people every day, but can still be alone. How have you built in this choice into your life that you are going to choose connection, not just with your spouse, but even with other guys. How have you done that? Yeah. In fact, I think it's important to call out. I'm glad you mentioned that. Um, I'll speak just directly to men. I think we've created without a doubt, the loneliest generation in human history, especially when it comes to men. And I think the rise in sexual tension in married homes is the only place the only place men get any sort of connection is through sexual intimacy with their spouse. That's right. And so they take all of that discomfort, all that loneliness, all of that displacement, and they dump it into that one act and they dump all of that act onto one person. And no one person can carry mm. an entire army of loneliness. They can't. Um, Sheila Gregoria, she's uh, a brilliant writer. She, um, she says, um, Men use sex to avoid having to do the real work of intimacy and connection. And I think, oh, that hurts me. That does <laughs> when, hurt. <laughs> when she said that, I was like, oh, oh, ouch, ouch. Right. And so stepping back even more so, um, our spouses can't carry this. That's right. And um, I took a call on my show yesterday from a wife saying, isn't it fair to expect my husband to be my best friend? And I said, well, it depends on how you define best friend. And she said, well, if I have a bad day, he has to sit there. I want him to listen. And I was like, no, 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 that's not a best friend. That's a trash bin. That's mm -hmm. why you're using your husband. So they can't carry that. In my life, um, I'm admittedly, this is one of a few areas where I suck at it, man. I'm really having to work hard. I've got some of the greatest friends on planet Earth. And then I packed up and moved across the country. I moved away yep. from them. Yep. And so um, I did three or four years of super long text threads full of memes and hilarious things and look at the football scores. And it was proxy. It was pretending we were still in community. We're not. Their life is moving on without me. And my life is moving on without them. And we can we can exchange information on how our kids are doing and how our wives are doing. We are not meeting every Monday night to say, how are you? How are you? I'm picking up the tab. No, you're picking up the tab. Mm. So the only way forward for me is to be weird and awkward and uh, I feel like a middle schooler again and say, hey, guys, y'all want to come over. I'm not cleaning up, by the way. And y'all got to bring the pizza, but come on over. And I got to be weird. Or when someone says, hey, you want to go see a concert? I'm so tired. Yes, I'm going to go. Mm. Um, hey, uh, we're watching the fights. All right, I'm going to go. Hey, will you come to this church thing with me? I would rather set my face on fire than go to a church thing with a bunch of dudes. But I'm in, right? And I've yet to regret going. Right. I've yet to be, be like, oh, I should have just stayed in bed. I haven't had that moment yet. And so... I wish there was another way, Mike. I've got to force myself into situations where I have community. And what's happened is I've made three or four or five really great friendships on the back end of that. And now we're starting to, hey, something's going on in my house. Can you talk to me about my kid or whatever's going on? Um, but I, I have to force the issue. We had a guy come up with me on Father's Day. He's a, he's a big executive with Coca-Cola. He's in his late 30s. And we did Father's Day. I did an interview with him, and he and he said this. He said, uh, you know, I began a community in my basement with some guys, and I found out how alone I was. Mm. And I just invited some guys in, and he said, I think we've we've raised a whole generation of Jeep dads. You know, yeah. we just wave, wave we just wave at each other. You're going your direction. I'm going my direction. So he said, we're just going we're going to start something this fall. So we started a thing called Legacy Makers. It's once a month. We threw it out. 200 guys, 200 young dads wow. who were right where he was. We, we announced it one time. Wow. But that's how hungry guys were of going. And we put them around tables of eight. That's your table. Once you establish your table, that's your table from then on. And we unpack a, a spiritual tension. Mm -hmm. And then you just talk at your tables. 
but it showed the desire for connection yep. and they did one guy they needed one guy to go yeah that was me yeah but i want to do something about it and then this last one i want to uh, to sit on before we get off choosing belief mm. why is it so important to live a non anxious life that we're grounded by a belief in something that's bigger than us. What would you say? Man, that this chapter wore me out, man, because I wasn't going to put it in there because I knew it was going to make everybody mad. It was going to make my close friends who I love and our kids play together. And they're, I'd, uh, man, I would show up in the middle of the night for them, and they are as atheist as the day is long. They're great scientists and research writers. And I knew it was going to also make my Christian community friends. That, that's my tribe. That's my gang um, because I was painting a broader picture. Um, but I think the easiest, best way to distill this down is from the great David Foster Wallace, which was an atheist writer, um, who says, we are made to worship. Make no mistake. Atheism is a privilege of the modern era. Um, and so if you are being created to worship and you don't have something bigger than yourself, you're going to worship beauty and you'll never be good enough. You're going to worship money and you will never have enough. You're going to worship shiny things, and there's always going to be another piece to add to your collection. And that made me go, Whoa. and then I look at some of the big psychology writers, quite honestly, so liberal that Bernie Sanders is like, well, let's dial it back a bit. And so <laughs> conservative that Trump's like, ah, it's a little bit far to the right for me. And everybody is writing about Communities and civilization for all of human history have had binding stories, mm. gods or a god that said, this is how you're going to act together. This is the rules. This is how you're going to love. This is how you're going to um, hold each other accountable. This is how you're going to reconcile and repair relationships. And in one fell swoop, we've gotten so arrogant, we just cut all the strings. And even with all the, the not all of them, but the some of the foundational psychological tenets, the goal was self-actualization. When you get safety, you get money, and you get relationships, and you get all these things, then you can critically think, and then you're self-actualized. Then you're the shining beacon on a hill. And I think if we look around, we're all there. We have everything, Mike. And the self can't hold. Mm. It was never intended to hold up the universe, and we don't have a plan B. And so what I'm offering with the choose belief, um, me and my family, we're followers of Jesus. We, we believe in God great. I've got great friends that are atheists that believe in the birth and life and death and resurrection cycle of nature. I'm going to die and become part of the soil, and then I'm going to become part of the next tree. Cool. Bigger than you. I've got friends who are Muslim, friends who are Orthodox. Jew. I don't care what you are believing in, but you have to walk out your front door and take a knee and look to the heavens and say, dear God, please reign, or I don't live and my family doesn't live. And there's a humility there. And I think I'm, I try to be pretty clear in the book. Belief is not about grabbing tighter. It's not about holding tighter. It's about letting go into this giant love that is bigger than you, that mm. encompasses you in a way that you never thought possible by trying to rule wrangle and get all the rules in the right order and do all the right things. It's so much deeper than that. Um, and only then, when your body feels like it's holding – just imagine yourself holding up um, a, a set of weights that you can't hold much longer, and your body starts rattling and shaking. That's the psychological equivalent of being anxious while trying to hold the universe up. Let go. Let go. There's a higher power. God's real. And I just – I don't still care what you have to say about it anymore. It's real. And um, you can call it whatever you want to call him, but God's real. And when you submit to that, your body goes <laughs> – and now you can go do the real work and heal your marriage and go be a neighbor worth being a neighbor, mm -hmm. right? And you can be a better parent. Final question. You talk about it in the book, You're a Christ Follower. To know that he looks at you and says, I know it's too big for you. Give it to me. I know that life's too much for you. I don't want you to bear the burden. I'll carry your burden for you what does your faith in christ do for your anxiousness what would you say when i was a young married guy 
I spent a lot of energy trying to get my wife's approval, trying to get her to love me more. And I thought the path, because I only had one rule book, and I thought the path was abs, and I thought the path was really excelling in MMA, and I thought the path was getting a PhD, and then another one, and I thought the path was all these things. And when my marriage was hanging on by a thread, and my wife and I had to sit across the table from each other and say, are we going to be grownups and do this, or is this where we part ways? And if we are going to do this, we got to rebuild this thing from the floor up. And it was part of those discussions when she said, I feel like I, I've been in love with a ghost because I just want you. And I didn't have a context for that. I didn't have a psychology for me being enough apart from my utility, what value I have, how good I look, or how much money I make. And when she said, John, I'm proud of you and I will never leave. And for whatever reason, in that season, I finally believed I listened and my whole nervous system went, <laughs> And so on a, a hundred X scale, when Jesus says, dude, I don't care what denominational rules you've put into place for yourself that you're trying to live up to. They're not mine. And I don't care what political person you've gotten in line with trying to find your path to me. I'm here. And if I was in front of you, you think I would just shake my head in disappointment or you think I would look right past you. I would hug you until you couldn't breathe. Mm -hmm. And there's, so, there's, for me, there's rest in that. And only then can I then go do the crazy, wild, ambitious, nutty things that I've, that I feel like I'm good at. And I feel like I've practiced for a long time and I feel like my community needs. Then I can go be the person I'm being called to be. And um, so, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's an exhale. It's peace. It's, I'll carry that burden, man. Um, let me grab that for you. And dude, or it's more like, dude, I've been carrying this all the time. You yeah. know, when you're carrying something and like you're carrying something heavy and your two-year-old son is like hanging on it, kind of thinking yep. they're helping. And they're making it worse. It's like, Hey, I got this. I got this. I just have a seat, man. Life's good. And um, so it, that's it. That's it for me.